Hello everyone. Today, I thought we would take a look at a very scary, very intriguing, unsolved mystery that not a whole lot of people know about. Is it possible that a gang of serial killers have been operating in 11 states, in 25 cities, and communicating with each other over the dark web, carefully selecting their victims from a very specific profile. And then, as though they were working in concert with one another or competition, every one of the victims die in the same manner. Always in water, always after leaving a bar or a party. Hi. I am Jack Carey, your host, and this is Threshold. Everybody, we're going to talk about the very, very unsettling mystery of the smiley face killers. This is a topic that has garnered a lot of uh, debate uh, on both sides. People who believe that, in fact, the theory that all of these victims um, were targeted by a group of serial killers operating since at least the late 1990s until present day, all targeting college-age white males who were all exceptional in some manner. In other words, they were either uh, accomplished at sports or they were considered to be um, leading scholars. Uh, in some cases, they were obviously both leading scholars and, uh, you know, sort of the in crowd, the beautiful people, the people that stand out. The MO in every case, which now numbers over a hundred, is a white college age male is somehow selected through a process we do not yet understand. The fact that they are pre-selected and uh, there's evidence to support that idea um, and just because randomly being able to get this very specific kind of person fitting all of these profile parameters would be something that would have to be planned out um, over time. They carefully select their victims according to a parameter profile. The two major points in that profile um, are that they are white, college age males, and usually college kids. They are um, usually pretty well off, and all of them vanish without a trace after drinking alcohol at a bar, um, in one case, a big college party that was taking place in like a, a gym type of thing. Um, and they are not seen for weeks, sometimes even months later to be found in a river or other body of water. Um, without the apparent signs of degradation um, that you would see in a corpse that had been in water for the entire period of time that they had been reported missing. 
Um, since 1997, hundreds of college aid men have died as the result of undetermined or accidental drownings across the U.S. While local police departments have closed these cases, a former detective and professor of criminal justice are investigating. There's two detectives, homicide detectives, and they're investigating a handful of deaths as homicides, um, although they believe that this profile stretches now to over 100. Kevin Gannon, Michael Donovan, Anthony Duarte, and Dr. Lee Gilbertsons are the primary investigators. And they believe that the drownings of these college age males are the work of an organized group of serial killers that they have dubbed the smiley face killers. Uh, the team alleges that the serial killers target and murder college age men before dumping their remains into local waterways and painting smiley face symbols near where their bodies are discovered. Most of the young men disappeared after a night of drinking with friends and were never heard from again. The serial killers reportedly from a highly sophisticated interstate network that uses the dark web for communication. And their supposed kill zone stretches from East Coast cities to Midwest college towns. And um, the fact that they share all of these similarities is... Uh, obvious to these homicide detectives and now to at least two forensic uh, experts, one of them quite famous and appears on a number of uh, unsolved homicide shows, um, have claimed that these cases, the ones they've examined, indicate homicide. In one particular case, one of the uh, forensic investigators, the, the uh, gentleman that's on all of these different documentaries now, um, and I'll have to find his name for you because it's not a normal name. He discovered that larvae, maggots, that were found in the genital area of one of the victim's corpses were in fact a, a species of indoor fly, were laid by an indoor fly. Um, now that would have been impossible had the victim been alive while he was still indoors, obviously. And more than one of these cases, the victims are found weeks, sometimes even longer than that, sometimes days, um, in a waterway that had been previously searched numerous times. Um, the same kind of profile fits with a profile of a pretty well um, uh, known investigator these days named uh, David Paulitis, who has written the Missing 411 books and, and done the movies about a series of missing people um, in the national park system. Now, he has sort of bunched up or bundled up um, a lot of the smiley face cases into what he thinks is his profile. I and many other investigators disagree with that assertion. He cherry picks uh, from the available evidence to fit his particular um, idea and disregards the rest. Um, and so when you examine that, you'll see what I mean. And that's important because of the popularity of those missing cases. Um, the popularity of the missing 411 cases and the insinuation by the leading authority of those cases that there was nothing to the smiley face murders is, uh, well, it's um, disingenuous, I believe, and um, could be negligible. I mean, really. And the evidence for their existence is very compelling. Um, one of the producers of the show here, 
uh, sent me an interesting piece of research. I'll show it to you here. It's called the Center for Homicide Research, Drowning the Smiley Face Murder Theory. Apparently, this is a, a you know, a leading document <clears throat> for the people that would like to argue against the theory um, of a gang of killers or a, you know, organized body of people who are going out and perpetrating these crimes. <clears throat> and I thought we would go through it because it is a very nice summary of the objections that are put forward. And um, I would like to, you know, address the points in here uh, with the available evidence in the amount of time that we have. Their point number one, <clears throat> Um, well, first of all, they say the non-recreational outdoor drowning deaths database, which how, which is a database of all of these exact profile cases. They're all the profile I mentioned, um, is up to 150. So number point number one on their, uh, problems um, with the theory list is how, is how they word it, is that of the, the problem of time order. So they say in science, we have to show that the two correlated factors occur in the correct sequence. Smiley face graffiti must be proven to have been painted at or immediately after the time of the killing. Some of the photographs of the graffiti show faded out, worn out paint that looks to have been applied years earlier. In other cases, the graffiti was found months afterward. There is no proof of when any of them were painted. While determining age of paint is forensically possible, it is technically imprecise, only narrowing to the year of origin. In many instances, no smiley face were found at all. Therefore, the finding of these faces is most likely the result of chance. Well, they make a number of uh, insinuations. They make a number of conjectures. First of all, um, their claim that the smiley face would had to uh, been painted uh, at the time of the crime or shortly thereafter or shortly before is erroneous in that um, these killers could easily have picked out uh, a body of water where some person in the past had already painted a smiley face. I mean, these are, a, a, if they exist, are a gang of killers that have been able to elude almost complete detection with a 100 percentile, um, you know, rate of accomplishment. And people like that don't make mistakes where they're going to leave, you know, freshly painted dripping paint where they can trace it the next day to a sale or something like that. These are a shrewd group of people. And I believe um, the overtones of the case even sort of fades into the occult. And I believe the perpetrators of this crime are actually well versed in the occult. And I think that uh, what they're doing could in fact be a type of ritual sacrifice. Um, I say that in part because of the absolute um, self-discipline, group discipline that would have to take place for not even one of them to come forward with some sort of evidence saying that they were part or a group of people that had been perpetrating these crimes for over 20 years. Only a cult usually can exert that kind of control over their practitioners over their members. I would highly suggest that a cult is involved. Um, they state determining the age of the paint is forensically possible, but they didn't do it in 
every case, um, it was sometime after the first few cases that they realized they were seeing these smiley faces. Uh, let's show you what these look like here. So this is going to kind of show you a map of the earliest victims and the uh, faces that were found at those locations. Notice how they're all in northern states. That is the hunting area of these killers. And they stretch from the east coast to La Crosse, Wisconsin, which we will show um, is also mentioned in these points of objection. They claim that the graffiti is omnipresent. Smiley faces were first invented in 1964 and have spread everywhere. Smileys have now become a universal symbol of happiness. They exist anywhere from children's stickers to commercial logos. One reason this graffiti is found everywhere is that smiley faces are among the easiest forms of graffiti to paint. This cheery graffiti is a cynical slap at the police by the vandals because these vandals know that many cities work to document every instance of graffiti for later identification and prosecution. Painting a smiley makes more work for the police. It is quite simply a taunting of the police by graffiti vandals. That's how they explain away all of these smiley faces found at these crime scenes. Now the one you see to the left there is from Ames, Iowa. That particular smiley face was also found with a writing next to it that said, happy, evil, smiley face man. Point number three. None of these smiley faces exactly match one another. There is no common paint stroke, height, width, curl, whirl, or drip. This makes it difficult to connect one incident to the next in the process of what investigators call linkage. Well, you're not going to get linkage from a loose-knit group of killers in competition with one another, uh, perhaps just a cult. Um who are extremely well organized. Um, it, the faces are put there by different people. Point number four, the word Sensaniwa, which was found at at least two of the locations, uh, they say is commonly found throughout the Midwest. It is a randomly occurring and graffiti found painted near several drowning sites. Randomly, somebody chose the word Sinsinawa. That's a word I would I would think up when I had a can of spray paint. Makes perfect sense. Uh, it means rattlesnake. That's interesting. Or it can also mean home of the young eagle. Uh, they say the word is relatively common term that appears in over 15 different locations around the country. Um, and this includes most of the northern states. It's a very, very strange. And there are several spellings of it. And that's the point. Point number five, no criteria has been established specifying the necessary distance that a smiley face must occur in proximity to a deceased body in order to be counted. So basically their argument is that in a number of cases, the victims were found downstream from where the smiley face was later discovered. Well, if you're downstream and you were put in a body water, it makes sense that you had drifted from the original crime scene. And in fact, there was some evidence to show that that was the case in the form of a smashed cell phone that was found uh, that belonged to one of the victims. Point six, there is no evidence of victim trauma. Again, they make a completely erroneous statement here. There is no sign on the vast majority, the vast majority of these recovered remains that they were the recipient of trauma. The Christopher Jenkins family alleges that their son was driven around the city for hours while he was tortured. 
Torture tends to leave signs of trauma. There was no physical trauma identified in the case consistent with an assault. And one death, Patrick McNeil, which I can tell you is, he's considered to be victim zero. He is ground zero for this phenomenon. Uh, the Patrick McNeil case is, is, you know, pure gold for an investigator because the closer you get to the origin of something, the less contaminated that information. There is an eyewitness who states that uh, this gentleman was uh, not drinking heavily, had perhaps one, two drinks, and then appeared to be completely, totally inebriated. Um, in a very large percentage of all of these victims, the drug GHB was discovered in their system, sometimes in large amounts, sometimes in small amounts. There were also signs uh, discovered in many victims that they had been uh, sexually abused. And in the case of uh, McNeil, one eyewitness, highly credible, saw a very um, mysterious, sketchy looking car that was following him as he was stumbling down the street out of the bar that he had come in. Now, as McNeil made a right turn onto, uh, you know, the nearest crosswalk, this car was seen to make the same right turn and he was never seen again. In another case that was one of the turning points for all of this, um, one of the victims actually had a handful of hair. That is uh, trace evidence being left at the scene. The profile fits perfectly. And this gentleman was um, dressed as he was white, blonde hair, blue eyed, dressed as a Native American at a Halloween function at a bar. Uh, he appeared to them to be extremely inebriated again, uh, without anyone really seeing him pound drinks down. And, um, he winds up like the rest. Um, so their point six, that there is no evidence, uh, of trauma is just wrong. Point seven, homicidal drowning is extremely rare and that's a point they think is proving their point but uh really it it is completely um useless in this investigation although homicidal drowning is extremely rare that doesn't preclude a group of killers who are smooth enough to know that water erases most and in some cases, all forensic evidence. And that comes to their point eight. The idea that water washes away all the evidence is a myth. Well, it's a myth in some cases. It deter, you know, it depends on how long that body has been uh, in the water and whether or not there's something under their fingernails. Um, skin slippage, all of that sort of thing makes it unusable. So their point eight um really is very very useless i don't understand why they even put that in there every one of these cases the bodies were found in bodies of water these drownings don't fit a serial killer motive point number nine again they make assumptions that no group especially a group known as the center for homicide research should be making they are making that conclusion, deciding that conclusion on the fact that we've not yet recorded that as a motive. Um, they don't even look at the idea that the motive may be something that is more esoteric in nature. It's the meaning behind the killings, not the killings themselves. Um, number 10. Confessions by correctional inmates are unreliable. And they specifically mention the Jenkins case, which is one of the Keystone cases in which a prisoner uh, claims that his roommate or cellmate 
had, you know, killed this kid, told him he killed this kid. Um, but there was no evidence at all. Point 11, the general environment of these disappearances are conducive to accidental drowning. Well, that's the whole point, really. It's a perfect cover for serial killing. Um, the idea that these kids are inebriated and it appears drugged um, slightly before they disappear, then it appears as though they are held for a long period of time, sometimes, that they are, um, in fact, sexually abused. That was discovered by tears in a number of the uh, crotch areas and anal areas of the bodies. The uh, victims are then um, probably completely drugged again, taken to the location, drowned at that location, and that location will either have a smiley face at it already, or they will include one at some point. So that's interesting. Number 12, the supposition that only males are drowning does not necessarily support a serial killer theory. So they're saying that this unbelievable profile of now 150 victims, all white males, all college age, all achievers in some fashion, all leaving bars after having, uh, you know, drinks, all appearing to be extremely inebriated, 99% uh, of them having GHB in their systems, physical trace evidence being leave, left at the scene. Um, I find it very interesting that they don't think that that profile is something beyond the uh, laws of probability, because it is, I can assure you. Number 13, La Crosse, Wisconsin, foot patrols and police have stopped over 50 intoxicated persons from the fall of 2006 through February 2010 from approaching the river late at night. Ooh, that's a whole 50 people were walking kind of around the river at night, huh? That's interesting. Um, and that's their point 13. And they mentioned La Crosse because two of the cases happened there. Duarte and Gannon believe that La Crosse features prominently in the mystery and may have, in fact, begun there. And I, as a paranormal investigator, know something very, very strange about La Crosse, Wisconsin. And no, I don't believe it has any connection to these cases whatsoever. However, I do believe it to be the strangest coincidence in all the paranormal world. For those of you who study the UFO phenomenon, you will know about the Majestic 12 documents that were leaked, uh, most credible UFO investigators that have been established for many, many years, believe those documents to be authentic, and they were postmarked La Crosse, Wisconsin. 14, and we're almost through these, I promise. The process by which intoxicated men accidentally fall into the river is already known and well documented. And again, they're talking about the La Crosse Police Department, which is just one town there. Um, and the, the police department claims that they have did a study where they concluded dares, suicide attempts, and most commonly accidents were what caused all these. 15, most of the drowning cases are likely to involve aspects of auto assassination. Auto assassination is not suicide per se, but a style of living with reckless disregard for one's own life. They included that in their argument against a theory that has very intriguing um, circumstantial evidence. 16, malicious drugging of victims is unsupportable by the evidence. Um, they say it's problematic because um, in some of these cases, the bodies were not found with GHB, but in a very large percentage, it was. 
and this is a point I'd like to bring up, there are other substances. Um, and specifically, I'd like to mention what's called devil vine or devil powder, where it has been proven that uh, if you are, if somebody even walks up and just, just blows a little bit in your face, you are almost immediately under their control. Um, and which would explain why in some of these cases, the victims apparently without any warning, just walk off from their friends outside the bar. In many cases, they receive a very strange phone call or a text and are seen looking down at their phone is the last thing people see. 17 GHB. Oh, we got that. And it says, Oh, 17. Presence of GHB in the victim's bodies does not indicate whether these victims were maliciously drugged or they knowingly administered the substance themselves. True, I went to college. There were bodies who were taking GHB. They were generally the guys who were uh, gym rats. And because GHB is used by bodybuilders, it speeds up the metabolism and it stimulates human growth hormone. Um, the side effect, of course, is that if you mix it with alcohol, especially it becomes, they feed up, they magnify one another. Um, and 18, the drowning of college students is not limited by region, but by climate. So they're saying that no group of serial killers would stick to the same climate as though this group of serial killers wouldn't be or know each other from all of these same states. Um, there are documented cases of um, truck drivers um, who had actually gone into a competition with one another, uh, murdering prostitutes across the United States. And I feel like this is something that could be not unlike the smiley face killings. And I'll leave you with this. So I've studied occult groups and uh, cults for a very long time. And I can tell you these killings have the hallmarks of ritual killings. And I'll say that not only because uh, the bodies are, you know, all fit the same profile, white young males, the cream of the crop of the white race in this country, but they're all found in these flowing waterways and flowing waterways are really symbolic of the flowing of blood through the body of the land. And an occult group might see that as releasing uh, the sort of fear energy using this event as some sort of ritual um, uh, to bring about change um, and perhaps that change uh, is something they believe the white population is responsible for, uh, in which case this perhaps could be the very first serial killings that might also qualify as a kind of hate crime. So that's all I have for you guys today. Uh, join me on next episode of Threshold. I will have yet another uh, mystery for us to explore. And as always, I appreciate you guys coming by. Cryptovania TV is a global leader in entertainment dealing with all things cryptid and highly paranormal. From Bigfoot and Dogman to Lake Monsters and the Supernatural, the legends ripped from the headlines continue to be reported by the team at Cryptovania. But the stories don't end there. Cryptovania founders Tommy Cooper and Jason Trost to join Mike Lucci and Chuck Larson in the studio to talk about the success of their channel and offer up some new tales of high strangeness on the next From Behind Tall Trees, Wednesday, March 16th, only on CARC Universal. Be there. Watching Threshold with Jack K, a Catskill Appalachian Research Collective production. For more information on this program and others like it, remember to like, share, and subscribe to CARC Universal today. To join the conversation on our Facebook group, become a member of the Catskill Appalachian Research Collective Facebook group. CARC. Relentless.